Good morning. Good morning. We are, we are living in some interesting times, aren't we? Um, the other day I was talking to a guy at work um, with some semblance of biblical knowledge. I don't know how much he had. And he said that he'd, he saw this meme of this old lady peering out the window saying, I'm just checking to see which chapter of, of Revelation we're living in today. Right? Isn't that kind of what it feels like? Well, last week, Pastor Ray began taking us through the book of, book of Jude. And uh, he began challenging us to contend for the faith. Um, and uh, as, he, as he began that, as he was speaking last week, I was reminded of some, some words that I felt were for a sermon. I had jotted some notes down and forgot about them. And so I looked them up and I just I felt like that this was the time. So we're not going to continue through the book of Jude. Um, but the word that I really felt was for us is stand firm. Um, but just to, just kind of what we've been going through, um, Jude 1-3 and this, this will tie in with what I'm speaking of, about today, but Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And uh, I tend to like to look up different, how different translations translate things, because sometimes it doesn't change the meaning of the passage, but it gives you some insight into it. And, um, and I noticed that the Amplified version, which, which uh, just kind of in the parentheses tells you, hey, there's other ways you can translate this, and, and has a little bit of, sometimes a little commentary in there. It says, did I put this on there? I did not put that on there. Um, for that same verse, it says, instead of, I was um, necessary to write appealing you. He said, they say urgently appealing that you fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. Now, I don't know about you guys. I don't use the, the term contend very often in my daily vocabulary, but I understand the word fight. Fight strenuously. I get that phrase a little better than contend, right? I mean, it's not just, you know, fighting for the sake of fighting. It's fighting to defend the faith. And, and why are we called to do this, to contend, to defend? Because certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. We can see this today. It's so prevalent, right? Every kind of, you know, perverted sensuality is promoted. Even those in the church, you know, or sorry, even, even in the church, we see teachers, we see preachers who are supposed to guard the flock, you know, they will take, you know, what is clearly written in Scripture and twist it at a whim to fit the culture, to fit what's easy. It seems like that so many in the pulpit or so many who are leading denominations, you know, they care more about how they will be perceived. You know, they care more about that than you know, telling the truth from God's Word. And they care more about, you know, keeping, you know, seats filled with butts than hearts filled with the truth. And I can tell you, you know, it's not always easy to stand up when you know that what you're about to say is hard. And that you know that it's probably going to be nitpicked. The thought goes through my mind often. It's like, what are people going to say about this? What are people going to think about that? You know, and how much more pressure is there now that everything is recorded forever on the internet? They can dig it up whenever they want. 
And so I have to decide. We as believers have to decide that I am ultimately accountable to God. He's the one who says what truth is, not me. He is the one who establishes authority, not man. He's the one we're accountable to. And this is why we must take a stand and contend for the faith. All right, and it's not just for pastors, just pastors who are compromising. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. When people hear a hard truth, when they are called to repentance, they try to shut it down, unless they're godly people. They're saying, you know what, you're right, I repent. But lots of times, they try to shut it down. Um, and they look for someone to tell them what they want to hear, right? And even though it says the time is coming, it's really nothing too new. The prophets of old, they got this all the time. We just went over this in our young adult group, right? Micah uh, 2, 6 and 7. Micah's being told this by the people of God. Do not preach, thus they preach. So basically, they're preaching to him, don't preach, right? A little bit of irony there. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to, the, to him who walks uprightly. So the people, they don't want to hear about God's wrath. They didn't want to be told to repent. They weren't told that they're in the wrong, that they give up their passions. They only wanted to hear the pleasant things. Oh, peace and prosperity for you. They said, is the Lord impatient? And that to me, just I just clicked with what's you know, very you know, popular today of would a loving God really send someone to hell? Would a re- loving God really send wrath on a country? And yet, when you look at Scripture, we see that we have a God of love and a God of justice. So we hear these things today. We who hold to the truth and call for repentance, we face opposition. And not only from the world, which is to be expected, but sometimes even from those who would call themselves believers, we face opposition. All right, so this is the cultural context that we live in today. We in the Western church, we have more pressure socially and politically to compromise than ever before. And I, th- I do believe that it's going to get worse. I believe that it will turn into, into persecution. And I don't say this, we say this a lot from the pulpit, right? The pastors say, I don't say this to scare you, but to prepare you, right? Because we don't want you to be unprepared or um, unaware of the enemy's schemes, right? But rather, I want... I want a warning like this to be like a heart check. A few months ago, I heard a, a dream. I think I might have mentioned this in the past sermon. I don't know. I heard a dream about this guy. Had, he, he claimed to have a prophetic dream about some scary stuff that's coming. And I felt in my own heart this fear just well up and say, what if that's true? What if this actually comes to pass? What do I need to do? And I start just thinking about fleshly things that I can do in my own strength to prepare. And there was a check in my heart from the Holy Spirit saying, who is your faith in? Who is your trust in? Who, what is your foundation? And so I just want to ask you guys the same thing. When you get a frightening word like persecution may come in our lifetime, what's your first thought? Who do you turn to? What do you turn to for comfort? Is your first thought is, well, that's why I need to get my political party into power? All right? Is it, you know, well, we need to fix the school system because they've been brainwashing kids for the last 50, you know, 70 years or whatever. No, that, you know, or this or that isn't constitutional. They're violating my religious rights, so I need to 
file lawsuits? Is that our first, is that our go-to for comfort? Is that our go-to to get enraged over my rights being violated? Who do you turn to for your solution? Is your trust truly in Jesus? You know, the things, may, the things may seem like they're getting out of control. But the good news is, we know who is in control of this story. Right? And we know how this story ends. We know Jesus wins. Right? He has already won. Amen? Right? Okay, turn with me. That was just the, the, the pre-sermon sermon. All right? Turn, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. I want to give you a little context while you're turning there. Um, Jesus here in this passage is sending out the twelve. All right, he's given them a few parting instructions. All right, on what to do while while they're out there, and then he tells them this. He says in verse sixteen. He says, "Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents, and innocent as doves." You know, sheep have no, like, natural defense, right? That's why they need a shepherd. Wolves devour sheep, or if given the chance, will devour sheep mercilessly. All right, and that's why Jesus, Jesus here is warning us. He's saying, watch out for these wolves. Be wise as serpents, and yet, even in your discernment, be as innocent as doves. All right? We don't wage war. We're going to get to this in a little bit. But we don't wage war the same way as the world does. Verse 17, he says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. I'm going to point out for a second there, for my sake. All right? I think it's Peter who says, you know, if you get punished for, for ungodliness, what benefit is that? All right? This is specifically for the name of Jesus. All right? You'll be dragged before them to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you will speak or what you are to say. For you, uh, sorry, what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Then he says, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Jesus is prophesying some pretty, you know, physically speaking, pretty scary stuff, right? People that you think you should trust, right? Your, your kids, your, your, your siblings, they're going to turn, turn you over. You're going to be taken before the synagogues and beaten. You're going to be taken before secular uh, authorities, and questioned for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Don't worry, you'll be given what to say. But these are some, you know, could be pretty terrifying things being told to the disciples as they're about to go out. All right? Jesus prophesied about this persecution, and the church, you know, has seen persecution ever since it was born. In many places, the persecution is still a reality. So by the way, just because I'm talking about persecution in, in places like, you know, China or Middle East or places in Africa, um, and there's many others where persecution is already there and strong, be praying for our brothers and sisters. Pray for them regularly. Pray for them deeply. All right? They, they need our support. Verse 22, Jesus says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures, the NIV says, stands firm to the end. Right? The one who endures to the end will be saved. Is it any surprise? Jesus says that we're going to be hated by all. Is it any surprise the pushback we were getting 
you know, in today's culture. We have senators openly criticizing a you know, Supreme Court justice nominee for her faith, saying you can't, you're not qualified because you're a Christian, because you're active in your faith. Jesus said this would come. We're going to be hated by all, but, but the one who endures, the one who stands firm, will be saved. In the midst of all this scary stuff, Jesus tells us, tells his disciples and us, to stand firm or to endure. Because those are the ones who will be saved. Jesus is showing us that we need to have eternal mindsets. Right? Mindsets on what is to come. The self, you know, his return, eternity in heaven. The souls of man are eternal. We need to have that kind of mindset. Stand firm. Endure. We should be looking ahead and not being distracted by temporary things. You guys remember Revelation 12, 11, right? It says, And they, talking about the believers, have conquered him, meaning Satan or the accuser, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And it says, For they loved not their lives, even unto death. These saints were willing to die for the name of Jesus. They would not shrink back, even with the threat of death. And you know what? Many have faced that. Many have gone through death, and I know they would say it was worth it. It was worth it for the name of Jesus. All right, but you know what? Jesus understands that this is scary stuff. He understands that, that this is not easy for us to, to, to look forward to and, and face. So he reminds us not to be afraid. Verse 20, skip down to verse 26. He says, so have no fear of them. So have no fear of them. Right? I'm going to say that again. Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Jesus said, instead of fear, we should be bold. Not only should we expect people to hate us because of, because of Jesus, we are called to, in the midst of that to keep proclaiming his gospel. Verse 28, once again, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So who who should we fear? God who is all powerful, all knowing or man who thinks he has power but only has the power that God allows him to have. It's easy to, it's easy to, when you put it that way. But when we look through our natural eyes, you know, not with the eyes of, of the Spirit, but that natural eyes, and we see someone who seems to have authority over us, seems to have power over us, someone that we want to like us, and they don't. It's easy to forget this. But I'll tell you what, it shows us, our actions show us what we truly believe. Right? Do we truly believe that God is the one in control, that he is the one who can destroy both body and soul? Who are we going to fear? Who are we going to trust? Verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are, more of, you are of more value than many sparrows. So if God keeps an account of, of sparrows... You know, which are like, they're cheaper than a dime a dozen, right? They're literally a penny for two, according to Jesus here. If he cares about them, how much more does he care for you? It says that he knows how many hairs are on your head. Now, some of you, that's not so hard, right? Some of you, like, it's, if you look at my hairline, it's, it's getting lesser and lesser, right? Was that a dig at you? Is that what you're afraid of? He's like, he's like, you're done. You talked about my bald head. No. 
No, but the, the, point, the point of knowing the hairs in the head is this is a detail that we could never know or even really care to know. I mean, other than you want, maybe you want more hair in your head or something. But you're, that's a detail that I've never tried to count my hair. I don't care. But God knows that little detail. God knows that little detail about each one of us. And he cares about you. So who am I going to trust? Who am I going to obey? The God who loves me, cares for my detail. The God who is all-powerful. The one who sent his son to die on the cross for me. Or am I going to I'm not going to bow to the, what the world says I should be doing. Look at verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is one of those verses that gets me to self-reflect like every time. All right, it makes me stop and evaluate myself. And there are times when I'm, I'm in the moment and this verse comes to mind and I'm like, what did I just do? Right? I don't want to deny Jesus. I don't want to be ashamed of him. And I don't want him to deny me before the Father either. Jesus has done so much for me, for you. How could I deny him? He is worthy of all my acknowledgement, right? Of all my praise. And yet there are times when I've felt that, that tinge of embarrassment when I should have been standing up for him. There are times when I've, I've felt this fear creep in. I've been afraid of what people might think of me when I was prompted by him to share something. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace when I repent of these things. Thank you, Jesus, for the boldness that you give me to not continue in that. All right, so you, church, I implore you to stand firm. No matter what's coming, decide now, I'm going to stand firm. You know, this is something I feel like we have not been doing as the church in America. We have been compromising and, and giving up ground. I mean, backing up and backed into a corner. Will you stand firm? Will we stand firm? Will you endure till the end? So we recognize that we're in a battle, right? Standing firm, digging in, those are kind of some battle-type terms. Um... There are times in battle when you've got to stand firm. You've got to stand your ground, even in the thick of the fight. It's when you have to stand firm the most, probably. Who here, just by show of hands, who here knows the story of Stonewall Jackson from the Civil War? That is not very many people. Just saying. He's like a very famous general from the Civil War. It's probably, you probably don't know him because it's, he fought for the South. And that's not a very popular thing to, to teach about, you know, someone who did something good even though he fought for the South. Um, so Stonewall Jackson uh, was a general, a godly man. I don't know all the reasons he decided to fight for the South. Um, but I'm going to read from history.com the account of how he got his name, all right? Jackson earned his name, so just, just thought I'd better clarify his name really wasn't Stonewall, it was Thomas. Stonewall is his nickname. Just thought I'd clarify there, all right? Jackson earned his nickname at the first Battle of Bull Run, also known as Manassas, in July of 1861, when he rushed his troops forward to close a gap in the line against a determined Union attack. Upon observing Jackson, one of his fellow generals reportedly said, Look, men, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. A comment that spawned Jackson's nickname. So my understanding when I was going through history was that everyone was retreating except for Stonewall Jackson. 
they were about to get their tails whooped and he stood firm he and his his men stood firm and went to close that gap that everyone else was retreating from and when this other general looked and said there's stone wall they rallied around his courage there's an example of standing firm in the heat of the battle everyone else is retreating bullets are flying past him but they looked to him for courage when they saw saw him standing firm and they won that battle against all odds here's something else that's cool about that story how was Stonewall Jackson so brave in that battle where did he get his courage here's a quote from him I'm assuming it was a captain asking him about how he could do that later on he says captain my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to be, but to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me. Captain, that is the way all men should live. And then all would be equally brave. How about that for living one's beliefs, huh? Bullets whizzing by your head, standing firm, because God's the one who controls my fate. God's the one who's in control. He trusted God completely. Man, and that was a man that people were willingly followed. They wanted to follow because he stood firm in his trust in the Lord, in his faith. Turn with me now to Ephesians. Ephesians 6. I think you guys know where we're headed. Ephesians 6. We're going to start with verse 10. Paul is writing here, encouraging the brothers to be strong. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. All right, so he's saying, you know, I can't muster my own strength. I must be strong in the Lord, his strength, right? Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. So he says our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. Although, some, although it, it gets played out, you know, in the physical realm with people, we as believers must recognize that that's not our enemy. These people who, are, who hate us for the name of Jesus, that's not our enemy. And I think we've heard this enough especially in, in this congregation, we've heard this enough that we, we have it in our heads. I know this, right? But it maybe hasn't sunk into our hearts, all right? And we forget it in the moment. Something happens, someone does such and such to me, and we don't recognize it as a spiritual attack. And so we react with a, with a fleshly response. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Lord, help us. To, to see the battle for what it is and engage in the spiritual battle, not the fleshly battle. All right, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. I'm just going to insert in there, as opposed to the armor of the flesh, take on the armor of God, that you may be able to withstand on the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having, the, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, first I want you to notice how many times the Apostle Paul uses the word stand in these few verses that we've just read. All right? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? To stand. Therefore, therefore take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to Withstand. I don't know if that's how it would read in the Greek, but it works in English, so I'm going with it. All right? Be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore. 
You think we should get something out of that, maybe? We're called to stand. What, what, does, what does it mean to stand? What does it mean to stand firm? I believe it means not retreating. I believe, I believe it means we shouldn't be sitting out of the battle. We shouldn't be snoozing. We should be ready. Let's talk about the armor briefly. All right. Oh, was I supposed to? Yeah. <clears throat> Notice here how the belt of truth is mentioned first. That's the first piece of armor that he, he brings to light. All right? It's because that's what holds the rest of the armor together, right? That's what holds the sheath for the sword. If you're not using your, your shield, apparently you can like, hang it on there. It's what ties your garment together. It's what, it's what holds you together, is the belt. All right? It's the belt of truth. We have got to know the truth. How are you going to stand for truth if you don't even know it? All right, you know what? Jesus is the truth. We have got to know Jesus. We've got to be in his word. We have to be listening to his voice. All right, we have got to know him. All right, and then he talks about the breastplate of righteousness here. All right, not our righteousness, all right, but that of Jesus. All right, and this is what, this is what protects our vitals. So we need to understand the importance of what's called having short accounts with God. When I stumble, when I fall, and I get this chink in my armor, God, I messed up again. Can you fix this? And he will. He's faithful. And just to forgive us our sins but when we confess them. All right, we have to understand the importance of this so that we don't end up wounded and taken out of the battle. Verse 15. And as for your feet, or sorry, and as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. I don't know what happened to my mic. All of a sudden it started falling off my ear. I wasn't even getting that animated this time. Definitely wasn't dancing the salsa. There we go. Let's try that. So we have the the shoes of the gospel of peace, right? Wherever we go, the shoes are representing where we're, where we're moving, where we're going. Wherever we go, we are ready with the gospel. And with the gospel comes peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Verse 16. In all circumstances, let me read that. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. All right? Faith extinguishes the lies of the enemy. All right? I must believe the promises of God over anything else. All right? Even my feelings. Even my experiences. Because really what that is, is that's just my perspective of what happened. That's not necessarily truth. I have to believe promises of God over my, even my feelings. My, one of the biggest examples that I have, because it's something that I sometimes struggle with, is there are times where I've confessed something to God. I've confessed it to him, and I just don't feel forgiven. I don't feel like God forgave me. And something that I've learned is that scripture says that if you've confessed your sins, I'm under the blood of Jesus. I've confessed my sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive. Even though I don't feel forgiven, I have to walk in the promise that I am forgiven. All right, and, and you can, we need to do that with any promise of scripture. All right, I am a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. Walk as if the old is gone, right? And the new has come. Those promises in scripture. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right, so we have here the helmet of our salvation. You know, it covers our heads. Heads are pretty important things, right? Um, our salvation covers our heads. It actually, I believe, it covers our thoughts. When we're walking in that, you know, uh, it, it protects us from thoughts from the enemy, from thoughts that aren't 
even thoughts of the flesh. All right, and we also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the Greek word for word here is not, you know, it says the Word of God. It's not um, logos, which is what most people know as the word, Greek word for word, right? It's actually uh, rhema. All right, it's a different word than logos. And the simplest way that I can explain how to differentiate these two is that logos is a, is a general word. It's spoken to everybody, right? Right now, I'm speaking to all of you, right? And whoever's listening online and whoever listens to it, you know, tomorrow and the next day, right? But I could, and so that's a, that's a logos. But a rhema, I can look at my wife and say, I love you. I didn't say that to the rest of you guys. I'm just saying. I said it to her. That is a rhema for her. Does that make sense? It's a specific word, and it applies to the, you know, just to the intended hearer. So when Scripture here says that um, that our sword um, is an, which is our offensive weapon, by the way, is the word of God. It's the specific word of God to us in that situation. I believe. All right, and, and God can use Scripture that way. He can bring a Scripture to mind. It's important to know Scripture. It's also God's Word, and He can make a, a general Word into a specific Word for us. All right, but He can also just speak directly to you, giving you what you need to defeat the enemy in that situation at that time. Right? And that is why this next part is so important. Because... I'll just tell you, but because it's the, it's the spoken word to us. This is why this next part's important, right? Verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. All right, so it's crucial to be in tune with God all the time since, well, since we're in a constant battle. We need to be receiving those words through prayer through communion with him. All right? That is our sword, <laughs> is hearing from him. We have to be praying all the time. Um, we need to keep those communication lines with the Lord open. Lord, what do you have for me in this moment? And listening. And one more thing about the battle. We're not in this alone. Right? Notice how he says to make supplication for the saints. We're called to do battle with our brothers and sisters. All right, we're backing them up with, with prayer support. Also notice that all that armor that was mentioned is front armor. I believe we're called to be fighting back to back, getting each other's back. All right? We need each other. We have to be in community with one another. We have to be in discipleship relationships, accountability, so that we, how else am I going to know how to pray for you? How else am I going to have, <laughs> know when to pick you up, dust you off, give you a big hug? How else am I going to know when to give you a big, you know, dope slap? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing about that. No, but ser seriously though, we need each other. Um, I've shared this before. I want to share it again. I was reminded of it. I had a dream several years ago. And in this dream, um, Whitney and I, like we're at, we walk into like this hotel. And I, Whitney went to go take care of something. I don't remember, probably checking in or something. And um, I walk out, walk out this door. And I have this understanding in this dream that there are some people who are soldiers or warriors. And not, but not everyone is. And those who have warriors have a sword strapped to their side. And I was one of those. And I, I walk outside and I realize like this, something changed. I don't know what it was. All of a sudden, I am on the enemy's radar. I don't know what changed. And I look across the street and there's this shadowy figure. And it is on me like a flash. And I pull my sword just in time to, to block this blow. And I'm struggling within this fight. And another, another soldier warrior was walking by and helps me, you know, 
helps me win this battle. And he says, how have you been out of the battle for so long? And I said, I said, I, I've, you know, I've had a, I've had a watcher and something must have happened. I don't know what that means. I don't, I have no idea what that part means, but something happened with that. And all of a sudden, panic just flooded me because I realized I am now on the enemy's radar and I am not prepared. So I ran back into the hotel room and, uh, Whitney went over and she started getting like I went over and started preparing a room this is going to be my defensive room and Whitney was over I don't know she was doing like a, a decoy room right they're going to go check that one out first apparently I don't know but I'm in this room filled with a handful of people and in this room there are only three other warriors with me and I said alright guys they're going to be coming any minute pull out your swords we got to be ready and one guy says I don't have a sword so what do you mean you don't have a sword? You're a warrior. This is your weapon. And the next guy, he was proud. He was like, yeah, I've got a sword. And he pulls out this plastic sword like a toy. I said, are you kidding me? That's not a sword? And I had this, this image of a real sword coming down and just shattering that thing. It was just a shell. It wasn't real. And I remember standing at the door going just had my sword ready going, I've got to defend these people by myself. I could probably defend myself, but I can't do all these people by myself. And I see a shadow go across the door, and so I just kick it down, and it was the cleaning lady. I was so jumpy. <laughs> it was the cleaning lady. So I, I, I must not have kicked the door down. I must have just kicked it open. I closed the door, and I'm standing there, and I've got the sword, and I just realize... I don't even know how to hold this thing. All I've got is what I've learned from movies, how to hold a sword. And, and then I woke up going, God, I don't want to be stuck in that position. I don't want to be in the place where I cannot stand firm, where I cannot defend. I don't want brothers and sisters to be caught in that position because I think so many who are called to be warriors, who are called by Christ to put on the full armor of God, don't even have a sword. Or if they do, it's flimsy. It's just a shell of a sword. It just looks like one. They have some Bible knowledge, but they don't know how to apply it. <sighs> All right, so I don't know I don't know where you're at, all right, with all this. Maybe you're standing firm. If you are, that's awesome. Keep standing. In fact, I would encourage you, find someone who's, who's struggling and encourage them. Show them how you stand like that. All right, but maybe, maybe you've been shrinking back in fear. All this stuff that you've been reading, you've been hearing on the news, hearing from the pulpits, it does cause you to shrink back in fear. You don't know what to do. You're just going to withdraw. I'm just going to like wait this one out in my bunker. All right? This is the time to stand firm. This is the time to stand up. Maybe, maybe you've been sitting on the sideline of the battle. All right? Suit up. Suit up. Get in the battle. And normally right now I would say... You know, if you need help with these things, I'm going to say you need help with these things. If that is you, if you're the one who is shrinking back or you're the one not in the battle, come to us. Come to your brothers and sisters. That's what we're here for. We're not here to beat you over the head. Not, not, I'm not really going to give you a dope slap. I was joking. All right? We're here to love on you. We're here to say this is how, this is how disciples of Christ are supposed to walk. This is how the battle is fought. This is how we get each other's back. This is how you pray in power. This is who Jesus is. And this is, you know, you might have this wrong perception of who God is. But this is the God you know, that Jesus presented to us. And this is who loves us and prepares us. Um, so as the, as the worship team comes up to close, I want to I encourage you. I feel like there's been a lot of like, you know, I don't know, hard stuff. I want to encourage you with this verse, all right? 
Jesus said in John 16, 33. I have said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. All right, no matter, no matter the storm that rages around us, we can have peace in Jesus. He tells us, in the world, you will have troubles. You will have tribulation. It's coming. It's going to be there. The world's full of it. All right? He says, but take heart. Take heart. Stand firm. Endure. Be encouraged. Why? Because Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Jesus, you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. You are our Savior. You have overcome the world. You have overcome the enemy. God, may that be encouraging to us. The encouragement that we need to stand firm. God, I pray for anyone who's shrinking back. Anyone who's been tempted to be ashamed of you someone who's not in the battle or not equipped to be in the battle. Lord, would you encourage that heart that they would not be sitting in condemnation, but rather spurred into action, coming into your grace. God, I pray that we would be a church who stands firm on the truth, no matter what threats we face. And Jesus, again, I say, you have overcome. You have overcome. Our hope is in you, Jesus Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.